Hello and welcome to episode 12 of the Capital Spotlight Podcast. Of course, your host, Craig McGrother, with the one, the only, the man with an absolute sickness, Rob Beardsley, and we'll get into the reason why he has a sickness, but the founder and co-principal of Lone Star Capital. How are you today, sir? I'm feeling excellent. You even commented on my energy earlier today on a investor call. As a matter of fact, I did. We're all working to uh, level up here. So it's very important to make sure that our tonality is crisp, our engagement is high, and uh, we're coming off as likable and presentable as possible, of course, to all respective um, investors, uh, LPs, and you know, you name it. We're working to have the best interactions, relationships with everyone. So it just starts with the little things, smiling with the eyes, um, of course, pace, tonality, clarity, uh, to convey the best message possible because we're always signaling and messaging with one another, um, whether you realize it or not. So we want to make sure that we are uh, the best of the best uh, at our craft. Um, the little things do very much so matter. Isn't that right? Well, I just can't wait the message that you're going to signal once you have a nice microphone over there. I know, I know. Well, we'll maybe have one or two more weeks uh, with this. Probably probably one more unless it's a road episode where uh, we'll both be uh, a little bit more uh, raw uh, but just real quick, want to do a shout out uh, to this show. Uh, if you think anyone might be interested in learning uh, more about what we have going on here with Lone Star Capital, please send them our way. Send them my way. My email is Craig, C-R-A-I-G at L-S-C-R-E dot com. If you think anyone might uh, benefit from learning about uh, what we speak on the show, um, this is actually be a pretty intensive underwriting kind of breakdown. So I think that this is applicable for a lot of people who are looking to learn more about real estate, whether it be you're looking to learn about investing or just the economics we speak about. If you think someone might be a good fit to listen to the show, please send them uh, our way, like, subscribe, uh, all that stuff. And now I'm sounding like one of those YouTube influencers. Ugh. But seriously, it, it would be great. We need to start doing that more and, and pumping that out. So if you do like this show, um, subscribe, like it, share it, comment, you, the whole nine, please do so. And then also, of course, our summit event coming up uh, October 15th to the 17th uh, at the One World Trade Center, which is our offices, um, tickets. There's very limited VIP left, and I think general admission is starting to uh, fill up as well. So if you would like to uh, attend that event, uh, meet our network, the best and brightest, you know, if you're uh, looking to meet sponsors, equity, um, investors, uh, some vendors as well, debt folks, uh, everyone will be there, or, or I guess everyone in our network will be there, or Moshe, to say, uh, will be present. So please um, be, have that be on your radar if you're looking to connect in New York City then. Do you have anything to add to those two notes? Super excited about the event. It's right around the corner now. October will be a beautiful time of year in New York, and we've got, as always, a great slate of talks, panels, group discussions, networking opportunities, we're doing a VIP only fantastic dinner at Reserve Cut. We were actually looking at the menu today. So we we're picking out some of the menu items today. And we actually decided to opt for the larger space. So we're reserving the bigger portion of the restaurant and the whole bar will be only for our event. That's going to be a fun experience. Better than last time, even the last time we were in that beautiful private room with the Classe Azul bottles. This will be this will be bigger and better. And then we'll enjoy cigars and and whiskey at Barclay Rex, the oldest cigar lounge in Manhattan. So yeah, it'll be it'll be a great place to to learn a network. Awesome. Well, really excited because last year the bar was set very high. But of course, we're looking to always improve and to be better and to get better. So we're excited about that. And then final note, if you or anyone you know might be interested in, in investing into real estate syndications and learn more about us and our process, what we look for, what we're currently have on our agenda, what we're looking to uh, buy at the moment, please reach out to myself. Once again, C-R-A-I-G at L-S-C-R-E dot com. If you're looking to learn more about what we're up to, uh, if you're looking to raise capital for us, partner, you name it, please reach out to myself and we will sort you out. On today's agenda, I think this would be kind of interesting because, you know, Rob is a man of many talents and has, you know, you have a very robust skill set. You obviously don't start a firm in a company and make it as successful as you have without being able to wear every single hat. But I think to the core of you, uh, what you really love most, I mean, other than I think your art is building businesses, uh, but to the core of you is the underwriting. I think that's kind of how you got your name for yourself, how you were able to sell without really you know needing to sell kind of like a ninja sell. Um, so what we're going to do is actually dive into underwriting on the show, as well as Rob's two books. Once again, they are the first one right here, 
which is the definitive guide to um, underwriting multifamily acquisitions. And then the second book, of course, which is Structuring and Raising Debt and Equity for Real Estate, which is almost one year old now, which is crazy to say. The event last year is when it was officially launched, which was actually, I believe, in September. Um, so almost one year one year old. So maybe we can get a little uh, retrospective and reflect on that. So we'll discuss those things. Um, so Rob's two books, you know, the diving into underwriting. And then finally, as I said, the man is a sickness. Why don't you put up your wrist as a little teaser and we can kind of go from there. But the guy just, you know, is allergic to Rolexes now and, um, you know, has got a, an addiction for the Patek Philippe's. So we will dive into the newest acquisition there. Uh, so lots to dive into today. But first, let's get started, maybe just into underwriting. With that said, just for those who maybe have zero real estate knowledge, let's break it down as elementary as possible. What is underwriting? Because we've all you know heard it before, but sometimes it just goes over your head and everyone just assumes they know what it means. So maybe just in the most basic sense, what does it mean? Yeah, underwriting is the financial analysis of a potential acquisition. This is core and key to any sort of investment because you have to obviously understand the investment by the numbers. And so whether you're investing in a venture capital deal, private equity deal, real estate deal, what have you, underwriting is critical. In some way, you need to be doing some sort of financial mathematical analysis. And so in our business of acquiring multifamily properties, we underwrite the deal through a simple Excel spreadsheet actually that I built years and years ago and have just iterated and improved on over time. And it remains to be one of the key tools that we use on a daily basis and that we use to share the numbers with potential investors to build trust and establish credibility and to also defend our assumptions. So that's kind of the meat and potatoes of where all the numbers uh, are derived and how we derive our projections, right? We don't just say, oh, we think this deal is a 16% return just because we think it's a nice deal and we we think it's in a good area, right? We have to take all the data of the deal, both quantitative and qualitative, and then surmise it and digest it all into the inputs, which then derive the outputs of the model. So with that said, why did you create the spreadsheet? Because wouldn't you think that normally that other people would have that? And, you know, was there a competitive edge as to, you know, your spreadsheet compared to others? Is this the most sophisticated on the market? Maybe could you pull up a template or something like that just to kind of walk through? And I will say for the audience right now, if you're listening on audio, this may make more sense uh, to watch the video of this. And a lot of people, you know, listen to this while they commute and whatnot. Uh, I will do my best to quarterback this and highlight this and break it through so we don't go too fast. So if you are just a listener, uh, we can accommodate that. But yeah, with that said, so just a little warning to those who are listening, maybe watching might be a better idea. But why did you create the spreadsheet? What was missing in the marketplace where you filled the gap? That was exactly my original thought as well as why should I recreate the wheel and make a new model when I'm sure a perfectly good one exists. But I just got pretty lucky because my dad didn't know a ton about the business either, but he said, no, I think you should build your own. And I took his advice. And what I did is I downloaded all the models that I could get my hands on and started studying them and running deals through them and understanding how they worked and then kind of figuring out, okay, well, I like this feature in this model. I like the way that it's organized. I like the color coding or whatever the case may be, or I like the way the formulas are constructed on the back end. And I ended up taking all the bits and pieces from the best models and then starting to craft my own. And I think what's super valuable about that process is the educational experience of that. Because when you build the model yourself, you're actually learning the inner workings of the model so you can trust it more. It's hard to use a model that you don't know or trust because it's, it can be a black box. So it's really helpful for us that we can fully trust the model and we know exactly how it works. So that way we can more so trust the numbers. And then the other benefit is we're able to build it exactly how we want it. And so it's looked different over the years and we've updated it and improved it and improved it over time. And that's a result of us underwriting hundreds and hundreds of deals, right? You don't even know what you want your model to look like until you've underwritten tons and tons of deals. So that's where we are at this point. And as far as is it the best on the market, I think it's all in the eyes of the beholder and kind of everybody has their own model that they like. It just boils down to, are you comfortable with the model? 
and some basics, right? So, so some basics that every model should have is monthly pro forma instead of annual. Monthly is is more granular. You know, annual it's just not precise enough. So you need to be able to have month over month growth and assumptions and then the pro forma. You want the ability to model out refis. You want the ability to model out more complicated capital structures like mezzanine debt or preferred equity or dual tranche structures and things like that. So there's kind of some yes or no's or basics that a model should have to make it a good model. But beyond that, it's really just use the one that you're comfortable with. What was missing um, in the other ones that you had, or is it just more compiling every nuance together in it, would you say? So one of the things that was missing in some of the more popular ones would be the ability to model out a refi, which is is good to be able to do. Not that we advocate re- modeling out a refi in your deal, but it's it's helpful to be able to model that out and see that. So that's a capability. Certainly the monthly versus annual pro forma is a deal killer. And so some of the kind of more available and more popular models have some of these drawbacks in them. And then organization and ease of use. So something that I did not like is if a model's on 20 different tabs and you have to tab across to a bunch of different tabs to input certain assumptions, I didn't like that. And so I built our model to have all the inputs on one tab so you could just easily access all the inputs put everything in that you need, tweak your assumptions, and then you can go to the summary and the output tabs and you can see the the results. And then finally, I think being more precise is not necessarily always more accurate, right? You can be precisely wrong. And I'd rather be roughly right than precisely wrong because it's not about being as precise as possible because time is a constraint. If all you had to do was underwrite one deal all week and that's all you had to do, okay, fine. You can fine tune it and input the rent roll perfectly and be precise, but that's not how we operate, right? We're sifting through many, many deals to find one good one. So we need to be conscientious of time. So a model needs to be easy to use and simple enough so that you can go fast, but complicated enough so that it's accurate. So finding that perfect balance is I think what we've accomplished. And that's a lot of the compliments that we get about our model. Speaking of which, if you are interested in taking a look, we are going to share our screen here and dive into it. But if you want to get your hands on one, you can go to our website, lscre.com. And we have a, the model available to download for free. Yeah, I think something that you know makes me really proud to work at Lone Star Capital and just you know you and generally just how transparent you are with everything. When we go to conferences, I can't, Maybe it it would almost be weird if we didn't get at least once a day someone coming up to you say, hey, I read your book and not only did I read your book, we actually use your underwriting model. Um, So and there is actually some nuance to your underwriting model, I will say. Um, So, for instance, I believe that this model will be too comprehensive and robust for folks who are underwriting something like sub 20 units. Is that correct? What is a sweet spot that your model kind of caters to, would you say? I mean, the reality is it caters to precisely the deals that we look at, right? Because we've just tweaked and tweaked it over time to be exactly how we want. And so we look at deals that are 100, generally speaking, 100 to 400 units. So that's kind of more so like institutional multifamily. But if someone wanted to look at a fourplex, it still would be possible. Absolutely. Yes. What would you maybe not include or include or, you know, is there just, is it too comprehensive when it when it when it's four units or would you basically just not filter everything and you'd get you know a similar equation on the other end is that correct yeah i think you can just kind of simplify it down and dumb it down and it'll work just fine it, it it's not a not a major not a major not a major difference gotcha okay well anything else before we kind of dive into it that you know, any notes any inspiration that you drew from it any kind of commentary that you've gotten uh, and also maybe just tweaks and changes that were important through the whole process is when you when you created the underwriting model? Yeah, I think something interesting. So actually, I have a funny couple of funny things. So our model, like you brought up transparency, which I think is really important and relates to this topic. We're extremely transparent with our model. And I think why why would you not be? But it's funny because there's other groups out there that call their model proprietary and that they keep it behind some sort of password wall and make it not as easy to access. And that doesn't make sense. Or better yet, they sell their model. And so their model is for sale. 
And I think that's silly because uh, a model is a model and an investor is going to ask to see it. How could you share a model for free with an investor and then turn around and sell it to a consumer? So that's why we give it away for free. It's helped tremendously in growing our brand and growing our network because it attracts like-minded individuals to us who are in alignment with our transparency and with our sophistication. So that's been a really fantastic choice, in my opinion. Something that, that, that is funny about our model is the individual tabs are protected. And people always email me asking, what is the password? What is the password so that I can unprotect the sheet? And there is no password. All you have to do is hit unprotect. But everyone assumes because they see that lock on the tab and they assume, well, this is a fancy spreadsheet. It must have a password. They assume that there's a password in the email. And so I'm sure this is not going to reach everyone that we want to reach as far as this issue. But hopefully if you're listening to this, you can now know, hey, there is no password. Go ahead and unprotect the sheet if you want. The, the lock on the tabs are there for your safety so that you don't accidentally overwrite a formula. And even though the tabs are locked, cells that are meant to be changed, which means their input cells, are pre-unlocked. So even though the tab says locked, you can actually still change that cell if you want to change whatever, the purchase price or the rent growth assumption or the exit cap rate. You can do so without unlocking the spreadsheet. So I think that that goes to ease of use, right? If you had to constantly unlock and lock, that's not ease of use. If you could accidentally trip up and press the delete key and delete an important formula, that's also not good. So that's something that we've, uh, m- you know, organized and make sure functions properly. What and then before we get into what are you most proud of um, from having creating this uh, underwriting platform? I guess you'd say or, or underwriting guide. I would say the fact that. Our model has been downloaded over 10,000 times. Wow. You know, that's that's a big win. And that's been a big way that we've gotten our name out there. And that's that's definitely what I'm most proud of. Have you sold more books or have more underwriting downloads? Uh, we've sold more books. So we and, and it's, all, it's helped because of the new book that you pointed out. That new book, Structuring and Raising Debt and Equity, is more of a broad topic, right? How many people are ready and willing to buy a book called The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions? It's way more niche, right? So structuring and raising debt and equity, that's asset class agnostic. Yes, it's multifamily focused because that's our expertise, but you could apply those debt and equity principles to office, hospitality, et cetera. So it appeals to a wider audience. So even though we've been selling the new book for about a year and the old book for three years, the new book's catching up in sales and uh, both of them are, well, the first book's over 10,000 sold and the second book's approaching 10,000 sold. So we're right around 20,000 copies sold on the books, which is a huge win. Awesome. Awesome. Well, let's get into the spreadsheets and we'll dive into the books after, shall we? So a um, couple things that we want to look at, and this is when the visual uh, component will come in. So I will do my best to provide as much color commentary as possible. Um, but let's just look at this. So this is the first page. This is on inputs. So if we were to send over a data room, which will have, you know, the, the OM, uh, the, you know, one pager on the deal, uh, broker memos, underwriting, uh, the debt and, and several other things, you know, that will be associated with the data room. This underwriting, of course, will be in there. Uh, so this is really, really interesting stuff. And this is on the inputs page here. Um, so let's just look through this. You can see the purchase price there, vacancies there, the year built is there. Um, you know, what are some other things uh, that, are, that are kind of interesting, Rob, uh, as you look through this? You know, how does your brain kind of work when you, when you see the spreadsheet like this? And what was kind of your concept and thought behind it? Yeah, let me make this way bigger for everyone as well. So hey, your dad, I already hear your dad yelling uh, and commenting and giving us the feedback as to being so small. So shout out to you, Todd. I think you're in Texarkana right now. Hope you're having a great trip and uh, are recovering well from the surgery. And please go visit the Rolex dealer. (laughs) So on the inputs tab, this is where all the magic happens. This is where we spend the bulk of our efforts on putting in all the information. So obviously the first section here is the property information. And this is just simple uh, purchase price, name of the property. And also, by the way, we chose to use Azul as the example property today. 
Azul is the deal that we most recently closed, mo our most recent acquisition. This is 90 units in Houston. We can share more information about the deal. We did talk about Azul a bit previously, but we just felt that uh, instead of using some sort of fake deal or a redacted deal, let's just use a deal that we can actually fully share the numbers on. So, so moving on to the operating income, there's a lot of copy and pasting that happens here where we're taking the seller's financial statements, their trailing 12, which is their trailing 12 months of P&L or profit and loss, or it's an operating statement. So we're basically just copy and pasting their last 12 months. And we're kind of going through it with a fine tooth comb to look for any adjustments or irregularities, because if there's some sort of one-time payment or something like that, we want to make sure that we note that so that we're not giving the property more credit than it's due as far as income or something like that. And, and then, how do we know, sorry, and real quick, we're looking at this on the operating income. We see gross potential rent and then stabilize the trailing, which is probably for tra trailing 12, the T12. The T12 is the last 12 months performance. And then stabilize is, okay, once we're in there for a 12-month process, that is the stabilized period, right? So I guess I just had a thought and this came up and I, I guess I never thought about it. I just know that with a group like us, we can kind of sniff it out. But for just the common person who's going through this process, who maybe is not as experienced, uh, but wants to get into it, how do you know if someone's telling the truth on the T12? Because there's probably some puffery that goes on. Uh, I would imagine from time to time, there's probably some um, inefficiencies. And I imagine with uh, potentially with brokers who are you know trying to get the highest number for their clients and do well by them. There has to be a little bit of fudging. So do you ever handicap numbers down um, when you, you know, acquire property or do you take them at good faith or is just going back to, hey, work with solid brokers who you know are you know more trustworthy than not? We definitely make adjustments. So it, it's we look for irregularities. We look for things that look weird and it doesn't necessarily have to be that they're fudging the numbers, but it could just be something that is just doesn't make sense. Or maybe it was more of like a one-time issue, right? So it could go both ways. So for example, maybe the property recently experienced some sort of management change or some sort of, maybe there was a fire, right? And that caused a, a higher vacancy and some some kind of gyrations at the property. Well, a fire, we're, we assume a fire is going to happen every single year. So we can kind of normalize that vacancy and kind of bring it back down more so in line. So the reality is, yes, we make adjustments, but also, like you said, at the end of the day, the majority of the projections are based on our stabilized assumptions. So it's helpful to know where the property currently stands. But at the end of the day, the returns are going to be driven by where we think we can take the income and, and how we're going to operate the property on the expense side. Just as an example, let's dive into the numbers more specifically. Looking at the expenses, I think this is a very big straightforward example is payroll. So if you look at the T12, the seller was operating the property with shoestring payroll, very, very low. And if you were less sophisticated or whatever the case may be, you might go, oh, great. Seller's running the deal at 70,000 per year in payroll. I should be able to do the same. And that's going to influence your pro forma, right? And if you had to plug that into your pro forma, the returns would have looked really good. And what that would have influence you to do is bid a higher purchase price and you'd have been willing to pay more for the deal and you would have arguably overpaid for the deal. But as you can see, we chose to underwrite a stabilized payroll number of 1450 per unit. Which for those who are watching, it was basically just a hair under 70,000 and then now just a hair above 130, which is you know essentially 90% higher roughly or a little bit more, which is a monumental monumental difference as you can as you can see if you're looking or if you're just listening per unit, you know went from 776 a door and then stabilize we're you know handicapping it and bring it up to 1450 a door. Exactly. So that's just an example of an irregularity in our opinion and us stabilizing it. And then if you look right here below this kind of answers what a lot of people might be asking which is well how was the seller running payroll so low you know what's going on what's driving this and it looks to me like the answer is their contract services are very high and we are actually projecting to bring the contract services down 
And so instead of having on-site staff taking care of things, it's a small property. So rather than having full-time people on site, they chose to just have more so contract services fulfill those obligations. And you can see we're doing the opposite. We're having higher payroll, higher dedicated staff cost, which then lowers our contract services costs. And the reason for that in this particular situation is actually because we own the property next door. And so we have economies of scale and efficiencies. So it makes more sense to allocate full-time personnel because this 90 units, which is an awkward property size, is actually now in our portfolio because of the deal next door, essentially run together with over 300 units. So that's how we're able to pull that off. Also, we might have glossed this over, but I think this is a really interesting uh, thought on the operating income, which is bad debt. So, you know, bad debt, let me think, oh, maybe it's, you know, credit card debt. It, some people get to call it a car payment uh, in normal terms uh, would consider that to be bad debt. Basically anything outside of, you know, mortgage or appreciating asset would be considered bad debt. In this world, what does bad debt mean when it comes to multifamily underwriting and, uh, you know, real estate uh, underwriting? Yeah, it's funny because when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, as all of us have, you learn about, oh, well, you want to avoid bad debt, like credit card debt or, I don't know, car loan. But good debt is real estate debt that's accretive and levers up your returns and all that good stuff. So, But when it comes to P&Ls or, or T12s, operating statements, bad debt refers to written off income or write-offs. So when you are... So I actually, I'll explain this because this is a nuance that not a lot of people fully understand or appreciate. When you are collecting rent every single month, right? So you have an apartment for $1,000 a month. At the beginning of the month, that rent becomes due. And <clears throat> you are now owed that rent. And in normal circumstances, you're paid that rent. And then that shows up on your income statement. And if you are not paid that rent, that actually doesn't just disappear. That unpaid rent turns into an asset on your balance sheet. And it turns into essentially accounts receivable, right? In our, so in, in typical accounting terms, it'd be an accounts receivable. In multifamily terms or in real estate terms, uh, we call that delinquency, right? Rent, it's delinquent rent. And delinquent rent is an asset because it's rent that you're owed, but you haven't collected. So only until such time that you decide, hey, this delinquent rent has been delinquent and we've been trying to collect it and we're unsuccessful in collecting it, we're, let's just write it off. Let's give up. That's when that delinquent rent that was an asset, you write off the asset off your balance sheet and now it shows up on your income statement as bad debt. So that's uh, you know a pretty interesting nuance that not a lot of people are familiar with. And what it means is you as an owner decide when you recognize bad debt. You could go months and months and months with all this uncollected rent and you could just leave it on your balance sheet as an asset. And it's a ballooning asset, right? You're owed thousands and thousands of dollars. At some point, you have to give up and you have to write it off. So that's why it's important when you're analyzing a property, you don't just look at the income statement. You also look at the balance sheet and you look at, okay, well, What's the delinquency at? How much delinquent rent do you have at the end of the month? Awesome. And then there's actually a couple of other components on this section for operating income that I would like to dive into before we get operating expenses, if you don't mind. So thank you for the clarification of that. And it is really an interesting premise uh, as we get to through the weeds here in the minutia of the underwriting. So another thing to put here under gross uh, potential rent is RUBS, R-U-B-S, which is an acronym. Uh, can you explain what that is and the importance of that too, please? Yep. So RUBS is ratio utility billing system. And so it's basically the property billing back the residents for typically water use, but it's also for could be electricity, uh, energy, gas. So that's that's really what it is. It's just an energy bill back. OK, gotcha. Um, and then other income, what would other income entail? You know, I think in some of our cases, there's 
um, you know, pet services where you can get grooming done. There are, you know, covered or paid parking spots for premium parking. There's washers and dryers. If there's not, you know, washer and dryers in some of these units, if it's maybe kind of a C plus B minus property. Um, but what would be some of other income uh, items here be? And how are we getting a 70% increase on that in this property or just in other ones? Sure. So standard other income items are things like late fees, application fees, could be like forfeited deposits, pet fees, pet rent. There's a ton of different other income that these multifamily properties collect. And some big items that can or cannot or can can be in other income would be something like washer and dryer income. So some properties choose to bill the residents separately for washer and dryer. Other times you just bake it into the rent and you just charge a higher rent because you're now offering a washer and dryer in the unit. Something that we're doing here at Azul, which is why we're getting such a big pop in other income, is we are adding a tech package and we are billing for this tech package separately out of the rent, uh, which is something common that we do uh, across many of the properties in our portfolio. The other thing we're doing is we're adding reserve parking to the pro to the property. Reserve parking and covered parking are great ways to get enhanced other income and get some juice in the returns. So reserve parking is a no brainer, right? People want a reserve space that's near their unit. And so they're willing to pay 25, even $50 per month to have a dedicated space for their uh, car that's close to their unit. And then on top of that, even better if it's covered. So a lot of times properties will have covered parking or will build it and we'll build the the covered parking. It's very simple to do and it's gotten more, more expensive these days, but it's still accretive and still you get a good ROI because now you can charge people 50 bucks per month so that their car can be under shade uh, instead of being exposed to the elements. Awesome. Awesome. Ooh, look at that voice crack. There I go. Uh, and then lost to lease. So I find it impossible for it to be zero dollars of loss to lease on any single deal. Um, but why don't you explain real quick what loss to lease means and the significance to any single multifamily underwriting property? I mean, this these are really just core concepts and for people to understand and to, to, to know these things, especially when you look at a deal, because people can really fudge these numbers. And as an investor, um, we all look at the IRR and the cash on cash and want to be sold that dream. But numbers here can really get manipulated. And this is how, as an investor, you can really get taken advantage of, unfortunately, in this world. There's a lot of great actors and great eggs, but unfortunately, like anything else, there are some people who can skew situations to the unsophisticated person. Um, and little nuanced, wrinkled details to this are why we're successful and why we believe that over the course of time, we will have um, you know, great investment opportunities, but just for the investors watching this or for someone who wants to raise capital uh, or just for your own general identification, these these things are so crucial. I just want to really harp on that point. But back to the, the, the thought here, which is lost lease. What is it? How would how are they reporting zero? And why are we throwing, you know, a you know thirty thousand dollar annual loss to lease on there? So loss to lease is the difference between your gross potential rent and your net potential rent. Now, that's not very helpful. So what that really means is you as the manager of the property decide what your market rents are, which is your gross potential rent. So I could say that I've got this lovely apartment here and it's worth $1,000 per month and I'm setting that as my market rent. But let's say you come around and you negotiate and you say, hey, the deal down the street is nicer and charging cheaper rents. Why don't you rent this apartment to me for $900 per month. And I say, you know what? Fine. So I rent it to you for 900. And so my market rent is a thousand. My leased rent, my signed rent with you is 900. So my loss to lease there is a hundred dollars because that's representing the difference between my market rent and my actual rent there. So in this case, the seller here managed their property and, and their, their books specifically in a less sophisticated way. Not to say that's wrong, but it's just it is less sophisticated. They don't they didn't have market rent and then lost the lease and then actual rent. They just simply said, "Hey, here are the rents that we are collecting." And that's it. Much more straightforward cash accounting, and that's why we actually are showing no lost lease because 
their gross potential rent was just their actual rents at the property. Okay, good to know. And then vacancy loss, anything you want to add to that? Is that basically as simple as, hey, these units aren't being rented this month or you know, there's some times that are more cyclical. Uh, therefore, that's about the amount of income that is lost on an annual basis. Is that about fair to say? Yeah, there's de- tons of different ways to measure vacancy. So you could do physical vacancy, which would just be heads and beds, right? If you have 10 units and nine of them are occupied and one of them is vacant, that's 90% physical occupancy. But the economic vacancy would be different because what if the nine units that are occupied are all studios and then that one unit that's vacant is a three bedroom, right? You would rather actually have that three bedroom be the occupied one and one of the studios be vacant, right? So in that scenario where the three bedroom is vacant, that actually be a greater than 10% vacancy rate because the three bedroom has higher rent than the nine studios, not combined, but uh, individually. So this vacancy loss here is on a trailing basis. What we'll typically do is we'll look at the last 12 months of occupancy. We'll look at the last three months and we'll kind of decide what we think is the fairest assumption for the historical vacancy. And then we'll project out the the further along vacancy, you know, and actually excitingly, we took over this deal a couple months ago and we're hundred percent occupied. <laughs> so that's why you should invest with Lone Star Capital. Cool. That's why you so, should invest with us. Exactly. So operating income, that is all sorted out. Let's just go back now. I know I apologize for those who get a little OCD about the order of things, but now we'll get back to operating expenses. And I think that was really uh, impactful and insightful. You just broke that down. So thank you for doing so. Back to where we are before. So just for a breakdown for those who are listening only on the operating expenses, there's payroll, contract services, repairs and maintenance, turnover, utilities, administration, marketing, other insurance, management fees, property taxes, uh, replacement reserves, and then franchise tax. So yes, that's a lot, uh, but let's get into this real quick. Payroll, as you mentioned, it's just on-site staff, contract services, kind of falls in similar, just people working on the property. Um, Obviously that's being lowered here in this instance. Repairs and maintenance, um, you know, what does that entail? Repairs and maintenance are typically just your materials that you need for recurring repairs. So they're not going to be major items. Major items are going to be addressed by your CapEx budget or they're going to be below the line expenses. So these are everyday, everyday maintenance issues with HVACs, with appliances, things like that. Anything that, like I said, is a major. So, so let me just actually give a concrete example. If you are going to maybe order a small spare part and do some work on an appliance, that would be repairs and maintenance. But let's say you were to actually replace the appliance, that would be not operating that would not be an operating expense that would be a capital expenditure right so it's opex versus capex and we can talk more about capex later when we talk about kind of business plans and things like that but that's that's the important distinction when it comes to repairs and maintenance and then as far as games what people do is they'll they're incentivized to essentially argue that hey this is not opex this is capex move this below the line. So it's not in my income statement. And then that puffs up their net operating income, which then they use to negotiate or to argue that their property is worth more because obviously properties are valued based on their net operating income. So there's kind of that whole thing of, Hey, moving things below the line, which, and I, and when I say below the line, NOI is below the line. So you have an income statement, you have revenue expenses, NOI, and then below NOI, would be non-recurring expenses. It would be your debt service and things like that. So anything below NOI is below the line. So those are non-operating income and expenses. Yeah, and then let's go to something uh, that has been a very hot button and that is uh, insurance. So insurance before went from 45K uh, which is 502 a door to 76, which is 850 a door. So why the increase there? Why was their insurance so low? Did they have a kind of a a, a low quality uh, policy prior? Or, you know, how could they get away with, you know, such lower numbers, I guess you could say? Yeah, insurance just generally has gone up a ton in Texas. So that's most of the difference here. And then their insurance policy... I'm not sure what kind of debt they had on this property. I know they just built it 
So they could have just had some basic insurance that isn't Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae compliant. You know, we have a, uh, I believe a Fannie Mae loan on this deal. So with those sorts of loans, there's more strict requirements as far as the deductibles and the coverages for your insurance policy. But yeah, I mean, we're just getting hit with higher insurance across the board. It's very painful, but you just have to put it into your numbers and make the numbers work. Yeah. And it's funny, the, the X factor that everyone's dealing with, and, and, and regardless of the marketplace you're in, of course, is the consistency of high interest rates. So that's a struggle for everyone. Um, but obviously, if you're in Texas or Florida or, you know, Carolina sponsor, even California and a lot of places, I know it's getting really burnt with all the fires right now. It's very- No pun intended. Yeah, no, I, exactly. Very funny of me. But there is that issue of insurance. That's kind of, you know, the bracket buster, uh, if you will. It's the kind of the X factor. Or one of the other X factors is just insurance coming to a place where deals are really starting to make less and less sense, unfortunately. And that's definitely one bucket where you can see clearly uh, the, the increase there. And it's not like, hey, uh, you know, doing other, you know, uh, uh, things like, you know, maintenance is great. Make sure turnovers, crisp making sure your payroll is on point. You know, those are ways to, you know, improve the value. But insurance is something that you need to have, obviously, but it doesn't really affect your, you know, overall adding to the income of the property. So it's just, it's very much so handicapping a lot of opportunities right now, um, particularly in a lot of the markets we look in. And even in Houston, we, we are out of the business of being in areas with flood zones. We just won't buy there anymore uh, for natural reasons. A, is it harder to sell to investors? Of course, but B, uh, if you're in a flood zone, um, you know, at some point in the five to seven year hold, there will be a weather event likely where the property will take on issues. And that's just for you to inherit and to deal with. So we're looking to avoid that. But even so, buying an area on, on our an umbrella policy in an area without a flood zone, we're still experiencing a very hefty lift there. That's about a 25, more than 25 percent spike in insurance there. And, you know, this goes back to wanting to work with a sponsor who likely has a big portfolio there because the economies of scales and efficiencies, even with our master plan, we're getting that hit. So imagine if you're someone that doesn't have a master plan, that number could even be up a little bit higher, frankly. So just goes to show how you know challenging this game is, how thin really the numbers actually are when you look at it um, to create returns. Uh, it's a very competitive business, as many people know. So you know, once again, who you work with matters. Okay, on to the next little thing. And I think this is actually interesting and it's more unique to Texas. I can't speak to other states for this, but that is the franchise tax, which is unique just to Texas as well. Um, if you want to explain uh, what this means and, and why it's in there. Yeah, franchise tax is just basically for any LLC that generates revenue in Texas needs to pay franchise taxes. So we just bake it in there. It's a simple percentage formula there. So we have that baked in and it's just small number, but just good to good to have in there uh, to be as accurate as possible. And also just to kind of highlight how this works, we never touch the franchise taxes when we're underwriting because the model just does the heavy lifting for us, right? It just looks at how much revenue the property has, which is here. And then it just applies that 0.00331 multiplier on it. And then that's the franchise tax. So we don't have to think about it. We don't have to remember to include it. It's just, it's just there for us. Cool. Thank you for that note and tidbit. And then finally, we're going to go down to some really important things, which is cap rate return on cost. So it looks like trailing going in cap is 5.8 um, and then stabilize. We're thinking we can get to 6.81. So how long do you think we can get to 6.81 uh, in reference to this deal is that a year long process? We can increase the yield on, on the opportunity. Kind of walk us through that. Yeah. So, to make some clarifications here, so if you were to just to take the seller's revenue minus the seller's expenses, that would get you to this NOI number. And I'm sorry, like for people who aren't listening, who are just listening, I'm we just saying, it. Okay. You know, yeah. Yeah. I'm just saying this number, this number. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. So, yeah. So, the revenue minus the expenses ends up with their net operating income, which gets you to what I will call an unadjusted 5.8% cap rate. However, we don't look at cap rates that way because like I said, the payroll with, with the seller is unrealistic. The taxes are lower than what we're actually going to pay. And so what we do is we do an adjusted cap rate, which adjusts for our future expenses. And when, when, when we normalize things, we get a more true reflection of the property's earning potential, which is 
the adjust our, our adjusted going in cap rate. And so that we have that number here and that's 5.6%. So we're kind of like you say, handicapping a bit of the seller's numbers from 5.8 cap to a 5.6 cap, but still buying a 5.6 cap 2020 vintage deal. We're very happy with that. Was, that was a very risk good buy. Adjusted. Yeah. Risk adjusted. It's great. Plus we also have a good amount of interest only on this debt, if I'm not mistaken, which would only juice the cash flow and the opportunity. And for those interest only means you're just paying the interest notion of the debt note, not the principal and the amortizing of uh, usually in multifamily. It's a 35 year amortization. 30. 30. We, we've been, we've been getting lucky with the 35s lately. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. So that's what I'm used to because I obviously work with the best group in the nation. Uh, but you know, exactly to Rob's point, 30 is the the standard. Um, and then we're gonna go over here to something that's very, very important to know. Um, and I really want you to spend a couple of minutes on this because this is this is important. So the very bottom of this uh spreadsheet under the operating expenses, um, if you go to uh sell, it looks like C45 is DSCR, which is debt service coverage ratio. So going in, we have it roughly per unit about 1.24. Um, and then we're thinking we can get to 1.58. So this notion is super crucial. And one of the things I want to isolate to all the people who are listening and watching is when you go to underwrite a deal, please look at, you know, cap rate is one thing, the terminal cap rate, which we'll get into, but then also the DSCR is pivotal to the deal. So please explain, I guess, in, in, in the Rob Beersley way, as sophisticated, but simplistic as possible. Um, the significance of this, why the 1.24, um, what that means, then how we're getting to 1.58 and why that matters and why that should be a massive green flag to an investor. Yep. Love it. I love this topic. And let me explain to you just how simple DSCR isn't. So the, and also I remember recording a video in your former backyard in Phoenix about this very topic. So just a little little shout out there. So DSCR stands for debt service coverage ratio, which means it's a very simple formula where you take the property's income. Here's the property's income. Let's say, let's take this one, 672,000. And you divide it by the debt service on an amortized basis. So what you do is you take the loan amount, let's say this deal has an $8 million loan and it has a, well, it has a 5.6% interest rate. And then you have amortization, which means on a 30 year schedule, you are paying off that loan and that principal and interest payment needs, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit. Basically the DSCR is your income divided by your principal and interest payment. And the gold standard is to have that be at 1.25. And so you can see going in, we're at a 1.24, which is basically 1.25. So that's <clears throat> that's why we have it there. And that's why the loan worked. And that's why the lender signed off on it. The lender would not sign off on this loan if the DSCR were below 1.25. Now, is now, that for all debt, by the way? Or is that only for agency? Are there ways in which you could have less than, you know, 1.25 kind of golden rule, maybe around one, if you're on bridge or floating rate debt? Do you mind clarifying that, please? Yes, that's a very good point. The truth is, yeah, you only, lenders only look for 1.25x DSCR on a stabilized deal when they're lending on a permanent basis. But a bridge lender or someone or a lender on construction or a transitional business plan, they're going to lend on a much lower DSCR, potentially even on a negative DSCR, which means that the principal and interest payment is more than the income of the property. So just to make things yeah. really bleeding, yeah, it's an alligator property. It's bleeding every single month. Exactly. And in that case, the lender is going to underwrite your business plan and see, okay, you're going to raise the income every single month. How long is it going to take you to get the income up? And then they're going to upfront reserve the amount of debt service per month that they're going to need in order to make sure that you can make those payments every single month. Now, and also for those bridge loans, bridge loans are almost always interest only. So even though the DSCR calculation is always done on principal and interest, the loan might be only interest, right? So if you're only paying interest, that's going to help alleviate your issue on your cash flow. And let me actually show that on the pro forma tab. And let's make this bigger because a lot of people mess this up and a lot of people get confused 
about this concept of DSCR and they assume, and I re- this is a bit of a pet peeve, I'm not going to lie. A lot of people will go out and pitch their deal and say, they'll say this. Our deal's so good. Look, in year one, it's a 1.66 DSCR. You go, oh, wow, that's fantastic. <clears throat> that means that the income is 166% of the principal and interest. The reality is that's not true because what they're referencing is not the DSCR. <clears throat> they're referencing the ICR or the interest coverage ratio. So in this case, the loan is um, interest only. So we're only paying interest in year one. And that's where people would jump to the conclusion and say, okay, well, that means my DSCR is higher, right? But no, DSCR is no matter what, always calculated on principal and interest. So here we go. Even though we're paying only interest, the DSCR in year one is 1.35, but the ICR is 1.66. So hopefully that's making sense. And hopefully that's helpful for people to understand the difference. No, it's really crucial. So year one, though, this deal is at 1.35 for Azul, which is you know 10 bips, 10 basis points higher than the kind of threshold that's necessary, which goes to show how great of a deal uh, this opportunity really is. And then, of course, peaks up to, you know, in year four, um, about 179. That's probably around the time we might consider exiting the opportunity, of course. And then year five gets 1.84. Uh, but as you can tell, Clearly, you know, uh, handsomely above the necessary threshold in order to make this property economically viable, uh, which, you know, Lone Star makes us very, very thrilled. So check out, speaking of year four, check out what happens. Year one, the debt service is interest only. So you're paying 440 grand per year in interest, 440 in year two, 440 in year three. In year four, our debt service jumps up to 544,000. And why is that? The interest rate didn't go up. It's that we're now amortizing. So you have to be, as a borrower, prepared for when that amortization kicks in. And so let me, there's a couple of things I want to say. So just to point out. And I want to add one thing as well. So when people talk about their deal being safe, you really want to look into the weeds here because there's an opportunity and a chance where we might not experience any rent growth for the next three or four years. Or if you are going to make an investment, you have to ask yourself the question, okay, is there a chance in which the economy is kind of in the tubes and it's not just exclusive to this deal because that's the case and everything's going to be hit. So, you know, you, you want to put your money to work one way, one way or another, but, you know, really ask yourself the question during years one to year five, or just whatever the debt cycle is, but probably just for the first three years, how will this property survive if we didn't really increase any rent at all? Um, so as you can see year one, we're at one, three, five. Obviously, if we get to year four in the property and we're at a one, three, five, we're, we're not the happiest people in the world, but you're not losing your lunch and your hat. So something to really think about is when you do look into the underwriting to be very, very conscientious of those factors, because that is beyond crucial. And there's going to be a lot of people right now who have deals that are getting capital called or are about to get capital called. They get, got burnt because they did not look at these fundamentals or they had a shorter term debt note, as we discussed, we were discussing earlier, hoping they can get a massive lift on something. And now the property is stagnant on rents or has gone down and you're really, really in trouble. So once you kind of figure out how to decipher what is you know, good information is important, or you just work with a sponsor who has a more conservative approach like us, where you just know that, hey, these things are going to be factored through the process. So just wanted to throw that uh, tidbit in there. Yep. That's very well said. And that's exactly the points I knew you knew why you brought up DSCR, because DSCR really speaks to downside protection, right? We can all look at high flying IRRs and we can get wowed by, oh, this is a 16 and 18, a 20% return. That's amazing. But what about the downside protection? So just to cap off this DSCR point, you can see in year four, when amortization kicks in, debt service goes up and the DSCR in that year is projected to be 1.79x, which is very good. And then our ICR calculation down here is no longer really ICR because we're not paying just interest. It's the actual debt service. So you can see they match up. It's 1.79 down here and it's 1.79 up here. And of course, it's really important that we implement our value plan, get our rents up, get the income up, such that when the amortization kicks in, the cash flows are still attractive. So, and you can see that being the case here. The cash flows go down from a projected 8.1% in year three in our final year of interest only payments. 
down to 6.8% in year four when amortization kicks in. So cash flow does take a hit, but 6.8% cash on cash when you're amortizing is actually very attractive. You're paying down the loan every single month. So you're building equity and you're still able to, again, these are just projections, able to project out 6.8% in annual cash flow. And if we can hit that, what's great for us and all our capital partners is that we get very close to uh, reaching the PREF uh, delta right there. You know, usually it's an 8% preferred return, uh, which does not mean cash on cash. It means that is what you owe before we start eating at all. If we can get to that 6.8, and then even as you can tell, year three at 8.1, there's a slight delta there, which is great. Um, obviously, we haven't hit the whole amount, but that would start helping with the accrual from, you know, the years before. But if we can kind of be in that seven ish to 6.8% threshold, uh, you know, we're all doing really well in the property. Uh, investors getting a nice dividend. And then we get close to hitting our promote, which of course, as a selfish sponsors, we do care about. Of course, of course. And so also not to go off on too many tangents, but for, for, it's a very good point that you made about PREF and how these cash flow projections have nothing to do with PREF. And so what PREF is, is preferred return. And so that's standard across our industry where we as a sponsor offer our investors a minimum rate of return before we get any compensation. So our preferred return, for example, is 8%. And that's not just cash flow of 8%. It doesn't mean that in year three, that 0.1% goes to us. We owe our investors an 8% IRR. So investors need to get a cumulative and compounded 8% return on their capital and all of their capital back. And then we start participating in the profits. So in this case, 5.4% in year one, we're actually behind the eight ball. And the gap between 5.4 and eight is going to accrue and earn 8% interest on itself to the following pay period. If we have time this show, which I don't think we will. We could cover the waterfall and get into that kind of stuff. But that, that'll be actually a nice thing to table as for next episode, we can kind of dive into this or if we're really starving for some content. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, I think that pretty much covers the DSCR discussion. I think that's really, really valuable for people to... Yeah, no, it's very, very valuable to, for people to understand. And, and I'm so happy we hit on that because that is one of the metrics that is most crucial to look at. I think if you could maybe summarize, you know, five things to you know, really digest and to comprehend that would likely be, on, at least on my end, obviously I'm not the author, the expert and the creator, but that would be one thing I would want to touch and look at. Definitely, definitely. So we want to scroll over to the other side of this just to kind of briefly give a give a breakdown. As you can tell over here, it has the unit counts. So it'll give you, hey, you know, how many studios, one bedrooms, one baths, two bedrooms, two baths, three twos, the whole nine, the square footage associated with them. Um, nothing too crazy there, but also kind of shows you the rough pro forma rent there. So you get an idea as to what uh, the unit should rent for. Considering the fact that this property is built in 2020, um, every unit basically looks the same in the threshold of the, the six studios. Um, they all basically the same finishes. Uh, we'll probably be putting some light upgrading to this, which I believe is just uh, higher end appliances, just stainless steel to them. But, um, you know, this is just a nice understanding as to, you know, what these units are. And the great thing, as you mentioned, this property shares a wall with a current property they have, which is over 200 units. Um, so we have a pretty nice barometer and idea of what these properties should be fetching for rent, uh, which is nice. And also this property being 100% occupied means we can send our other potential and prospective tenants uh, the other way to look at units um, just next door, which is a nice way to capture uh, and harvest um, just good synergies. So definitely. Yeah. So moving to the right here, we have our assumptions and these are just basic uh, the assumptions that we just go into the deal. So we plug in, we don't really change this, but this, this is just where we plug in the acquisition fee. There's no transfer tax, closing costs, cash reserves. Let me have my OCD kick in and let me just uh, change this to currency format. So let me pause and also talk about cash reserves. So what our standard cash reserves is, is actually, I'll break down the formula here. It's, I know it's small, but it's two months worth of expenses and debt service. And sometimes we do three months. I would say more often lately we do three months versus two months, but this deal is stabilized. It's basically brand new. So two months we felt is enough reserve for this deal. So uh, that's what we went with here. And that equals 
193,000. So that's our cash reserve there. Interest reserve is kind of what I mentioned, exactly what I mentioned before is when a lender, there's a couple of different definitions of interest, interest reserve, but when a lender holds interest reserve, that's actually a separate kind of account that they hold where you can pay debt service out of that account. And that's a way for you to, well, for the lender to ensure that you don't get behind on your payments, that they just have the cash there ready to go to pay themselves the interest. And then another interest reserve is would be just be you hold it for yourself. So you hold a little bit of extra. It's essentially just another cash reserve, just however you want to look at it. On this side, we also have the senior debt. And so in this case, we are assuming a $7.9 million loan. I don't want to get into too much of the nitty gritty of how the spreadsheet works. Frankly, it's, I've, I've done that before. But just to point out, this is actually not at a loan assumption. You know, so sometimes we this will just say, no, it's not a loan assumption. And then the loan to value calculation will kick in. Uh, but in this case, we just override the loan to value percentage assumption and just put in the direct loan amount just as a, an easier way to kind of fix the loan proceeds. Yeah, and these are simple things. This is more just, you know, debt, as Rob just mentioned, maybe we could expedite this process. These are just kind of some of the, the debt terms. It's really, you know, you can plug that in for each deal. That's not rocket science. It's not anything to really expand on. That's just a matter of fact. Um, so if we want to just scroll through this uh, to your point, uh, maybe can we just highlight anything that I might see of interest? Yeah, I mean, we kind of have gone through a lot of that kind of prior before, uh, or before, excuse me. Uh, so nothing really to note there. If you want to maybe scroll back up and go to the right, perhaps, unless there's something you want to add. Um, well, I'll just touch on maybe a couple quick things. The, the annual rent increase, annual expense increase. These are important. You know, I saw the other day, a very reputable sponsor, I'm not saying anything bad here, but they were using 5% per year in rent growth. These were Bay Area properties. So, you know, maybe they think the Bay Area is going to rebound and grow. I think that's what they're banking on, right? Because the Bay Area in California saw a, a pretty strong rent recession. But in any case, the rent increase assumption every single year is a very sensitive input. So if you're more aggressive here, it's going to impact the returns in a big way. And, and I think I want to mention something too, that 3% is 3%, you know, compounding year over year. So if it's 5% over a five-year hold, five times five, that's not just, oh, well, you know, five plus five plus five, plus five okay, it's 25. We can all do simple arith arithmetic. That is actually a lot greater than just, you know, that right there. So 3% accruing uh, for a five-year hold. I mean, I'm pretty sure you already on everything projects about 3.5% in Houston, especially in the pockets we look for, because we look for areas that are a little more starved and supply coming to the market. Of course, uh, that's one of our big missions, but 3%, we usually round down just to make our numbers a little more conservative. We don't really want to fudge with them um, too much, especially as a looming recession may or may not come. But this goes back to another key component in the underwriting, probably one of the top five things I would look at, or maybe if it's top 10, for sure make top 10, I would definitely add it to my top five is, hey, what are your annual rent increases um, to come up with your projections and numbers? 3%, typically speaking, is very modest. Yeah. And let's just highlight that real quick. So this deal has a 15.4 projected IRR for investors. That's net of fees, net of promote. If we pop this up to 5%, let's say that's mm -hmm. going to take it to 18.2. So is it possible? Absolutely. Is it something smart to underwrite? No, definitely not. So you can see it has a dramatic impact on the returns. And then also something very interesting is, let's say you don't experience 5% rent growth, but let's say inflation runs high for five years. And let's say instead of a 3% rent growth with 2% expense growth, which is 1% of real rent growth, right? Let's just say inflation runs high and you get 5% rent growth and 4% expense growth you're still getting an 18%. It's still way bigger return than the three over two. So it just shows you that inflation is good for real estate. Like even if you did, for example, let's well, say- for investors on our side of the aisle. <laughs> let's say if you did like 4% rent growth and 5% expense growth. So actually inflation is hitting expenses harder than rents. It still boosts the returns. 
than if you were to have 1% real growth. So that that shows you the inflation resistance, resistant nature of real estate. That's awesome. So do we want to kind of dive into and go over to the summary section? Because I think this is something that investors really would like to look at. Um, so this is kind of just a high level overview of everything going on for the Azul property, purchase price, the loan to value to the deal, um, you know, the interest period. You've got a lot of great numbers there. Um, you know, what I find is really interesting here is it shows you the project summary, so the stabilization process. So this is showing 18 months, which is a year and a half. The hold period, uh, average rent premium that we're looking to achieve, the capex and reserves necessary for the property, based with the purchase price and the target exit price. Uh, and then what you'll also see the more, most important thing, if you're an LP investor or a capital raiser is, Hey, if I give a certain number, what does that look like? What does that turn into? Um, so under the investment summary, you can see that if you just want to put, let's say a hundred thousand dollars in, uh, for simple math, uh, what, what it will turn into. And this is kind of a lot of the times with, you know, the LP investors that I deal with, that's kind of the number that they're thinking of throwing around. It's very common for, for some investors. So, you know, for this deal, year one, we're projecting, you know, 5,400 bucks, which is roughly, you know, call it uh, 400-ish or yeah, about $400 a month, roughly, maybe four, 420 or so uh, a month if you were to invest $100,000 there. And then it spikes up, of course, as mentioned. Um, but the average cash on cash of this deal is about 7%, which is pretty great. Um, and then obviously on the exit of the property, you'll get about $160,000, just a hair under that on projected numbers, assuming that we hit um, this. But as you can tell, this is a very sophisticated formula that has a lot of intricacies to it, where if you kind of throw off a couple of numbers here and there, or frankly, as a sponsor, if you choose to, maybe not, I wouldn't say be unethical, but want to uh, juice a deal up, you can very quickly see that these numbers are not, these are, these numbers are not the Bible. These numbers are not set in stone. These things are all fluid. So who you work with really matters, making sure that you trust the person really matters and making sure that you have an understanding of this matters because, you know, people, I think, you know, often, and often investors are so hungry and chased on the IRR return. They're so fixated on what the potential yield looks like. They don't actually look at the underwriting. They want to believe whatever the sponsor is telling them. So to really get an understanding of the nuts and bolts and how these numbers are, uh, you know, create the certain return is just so important to think about and to really analyze when you're going to, you know, give your hard earned dollars. You want your money to work harder for you than you earn work for it. So just to make sure that the projections are, are crisp and accurate and are reasonable and sound is just beyond uh, important. Yeah, it's, it's everything and it, you have to be able to trust these numbers. So yeah, the summary tab is a great place to get a lot of information in a pretty easy format. Like you pointed out, there's a lot of kind of the highlight metrics and things that you want to look for. Is there anything else that we want to spend time yeah. on the model? I actually just want to go over real quick on this page. Uh, if you actually just tab over once more, just for helpful links, um, it's super important to kind of th throw up a lot of things that we have, uh, you know, as to how we come up with these numbers. So there are, you know, certain certain metrics that that we use here, and certain little cheat sheets and and, and pieces to our puzzle that are put together that we do provide our investors when a deal comes to the marketplace. So just little things like this are, are, are very, very crucial. And then of course you can tell, and this is nice for me, just if I need to cheat while I'm on the phone, people ask, Hey, what's going on with the increases? And it's like, okay, well, give me one moment. I look like an expert because I can pull up the, you know, rent currently and what our performance is going to look like. Um, you know, the increases so as you can tell right here, 1265, we're pushing to shoot the average rent to, you know, just shy of 1400 bucks. So, uh, you know, it's just little things like that are, are really, really crucial. And then another thing to look at on the projected summaries as well is the exit cap. So going in and the exit cap are, are really, really important. That's how also you can kind of throw off numbers because if you want to play at that and get sensitive, I mean, if you sell this for, you know, four, seven, five, the numbers look really great. Great. If you sell this for a six cap, well, then things really start to change. So let's, let's look at the difference there. You know, if we didn't even move anything, but we move the number to a 475 cap, the IRR boosts up basically, you know, three, uh, three whole points, which is massive. And then similarly, if you go to a 6% cap rate on the, on the terminal cap, 
if you want to go there, uh, you know, the number gets down to, you know, still a pretty modest return of a 13.3%. So I don't think anyone's ever mad at 13.3%. The beauty of a deal like this is what's going to happen. The cash on cash with a fixed rate debt is going to be a lot more consistent. And this is why we love the agency route. However, it's just when it comes to the exit, we're all um, you know, a hundred basis point hike up or down or a hundred point, point hike up or a hundred point decrease away from making a ton of money as a sponsor and an investor. So it's just so funny how sensitive um, the interest rate environment really is to uh, creating returns and how, you know, when the economy kind of uh, turns back on and rates start getting cut, the crucial nature of uh, all these things come together, but especially in the terminal cap with interest rates really uh, has a large impact on the uh, value of, you know, all real estate. Yeah. And right now, in particular, there's a lot of question marks about exit cap rates. A lot of people feel there's a great uncertainty about them and where are they going to land? And so it's not an easy time to buy real estate for many reasons. It's never easy to buy real estate, right? Because when the fundamentals and the capital markets look good, there's a lot of competition. Right now, there's less buyer competition, but there's headwinds on the capital market side, which specifically with higher interest rates. And then there's also the uncertainties on the back end with, you know, how much are you going to be able to sell the deal for? Are you going to be able to sell it for a five cap? Are you going to be able to sell it for a six cap? And <clears throat> taking this deal as an example, it's 2020 vintage deal in a growth submarket of Houston. A year and a half ago, this would have sold for less than a four cap, probably. We're buying it for a 5.6. So does that mean we should project to exit for a six? Should we project it to exit back in the heyday at a 4.5? You know, it, it, people don't know. And that makes it a bit harder today. And, and the debt came in roughly around par with the, the cap rate. Is that correct? Or maybe, you know, a couple bips higher? Yeah, I think we locked it at 5.59 officially, but basically 5.6. I mean, that's basically, yeah. So basically neutral there, which is massive. I mean, that's that's really hard to do uh, and create. So, you know, finding a deal like this, albeit smaller, you know, on a 90 unit size as what we like, there are exceptions to the rules and this deal is definitely an exception. Um, we don't probably have enough time to go through more than that. I think that's a really nice high level overview, but if you wouldn't mind just clicking on the pro forma, maybe just the waterfall, uh, you know, just you get an idea. I mean, this is you know, a lot to go through. We're not going to go through this all, but this just goes to show the comprehensive nature, the things that we look through, the things that uh, we're working on. All, these numbers are not just us creating, hey, it's going to be a 15 IRR. You know, we're solving for that. No, these are really thoughtful um, and detailed notes and inputs that take a very long time for us to come through with uh, and are just crucial. And then as you see the, the sensitivity, you can kind of see and, and kind of mock out what best case and worst case could look like over the whole period, depending upon where, you know, debt goes, uh, the holding process, what the IRR is, what the vacancy or sorry, occupancy, occupancy and such. There's a lot, just so much thought really tethered into these whole equations. And uh, it's really a lot more than that would probably likely meet the eye, especially work with a group like us. I can't really speak for other firms. I know there's a lot of people that do great work, but you know we really stand behind uh, what we have created, what you've created here. Um, and it's been a Bible for us and kind of a North Star as we go through you know every single market cycle. And then Absolutely. if you would, yeah, finally, if you just go to the CapEx, which is, you know, just, hey, oh, I don't know if there's yeah nothing in there right now. Uh, not much cap access property, but typically speaking, there is a vivid and detailed list there. Uh, but that about wraps up the conversation here, which I know was almost probably an hour long on the underwriting side. Do you have any final thoughts you wanted to walk through on this one, RB3? No, I mean, I think this is a good walkthrough of the spreadsheet. I don't know if you wanted to talk about the books in general or if there's other things that you wanted to talk yeah. about today. We could table the books for next week. Would you want to go on that? Or would you want to house house that, let it go and come back to it? It's totally up to you. All right. All right. Well, since we are on the topic of creating, um, I think it's really going to be cool for us to go through. Um, how about we actually save this book for next week? Because I think next week was officially the week it went live. So we will save this and house this as a one year uh, anniversary because I believe the conference last year is September 17th, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm going to delay that one right now, but let's just talk about this book right here. Your first book is once again, if you want to buy the book, it's available on Amazon, of course, The Definitive Guide to Underwriting Multifamily Acquisitions. So you wrote this book when you were how old? 
Oh, it was during COVID. I was 20, what, 22, 23, 23, let's say. Okay. So you wrote this book, the first book when you're 23, what gave you the inspiration for it? And, you know, why did you do it? And, you know, did you ever feel a, maybe a slight imposter syndrome? I'm like, Hey, I'm some, you know, 22, 23 year old guy, obviously I got some deals under my belt, but who the heck am I writing a book like this? And I'm going to sell it. So did you, do you feel that way at all? And obviously you're, you're brilliant and a lot wiser than people that are probably 80, but just generally speaking, of course, that, you know, could have ran through your head. So you maybe kind of walk us through your mindset where you were in life and kind of your thought on the book and, and the need for it in the marketplace. So the way I rationalized it was if I were to have written a book at that time or today about how to be successful in multifamily and have a ton of exits and all that stuff, I would have imposter syndrome on that. And so what I felt at that time is, hey, I may not have a multi-billion dollar portfolio, but I know how to underwrite and I don't have to have a billion dollar portfolio to know how to underwrite because I can just sit there and underwrite a bunch of deals and become an expert without doing a whole lot. That's not obviously it's better to be in the trenches and have the experience and own property and continue to learn and everything. But at that time, I felt like safer if I could hide behind the numbers and hide behind uh, not philosophy, but, you know, kind of textbook type information. And so that's why I felt comfortable writing a book like this in such an authoritative voice, because I felt that I had the experience on the underwriting side. I may not have had the deal experience doing a hundred deals. So yeah, so that's how I did it. Or that's kind of how I approached the, 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 my, the thought process. And I wrote the book in a very straightforward way. Didn't talk about my life and, or my, my dreams and aspirations and teamwork and all this. No, very straightforward. I wrote the book kind of how we just went through the spreadsheet. I went through line by line, input by input, assumption by assumption, really just detailed all my thoughts about uh, every single input and assumption. And just like you, uh, as a speaker, as a talker, anytime that you are uh, communicating, you are to the point, you are brief and brilliant. And I think that's very much so uh, something consistent in this book. It's a really long 107 page book. So you could probably get through this in a flight, depending upon your reading speed, uh, or even in a week or so, if you're looking to really cram and, and figure some things out. If you're a college student looking to you know, acquire more information, I spoke to someone today who actually represents um, a bunch of students. Uh, University of Michigan, they have an investment fund and they look to pitch deals and whatnot, which is interesting. So anyone there, if you're looking for education, that's a great way to look. If you're looking to you know, have an understanding of just you know, a more comprehensive knowledge of real estate other than, oh, where's the property located? What does it look like? What are the aesthetics? This is a great way to actually understand nuts and bolts uh, to the deal, as with the spreadsheet we just went through. Uh, I think this could be some really nice evergreen content, but that's awesome. Uh, with that said, how many copies of the books have you sold? What's been kind of your biggest takeaway as the author from you know doing this and putting yourself out there? Yeah, so I, I forgot to mention that part. So in total between the two books, we're right around 20,000 copies sold. Also, I procrastinated on this, but I did get around to earlier this year recording the audio ver book versions of both books. For people like me who are very dyslexic and uh, listen and absorb a lot more via listening than uh, reading, of course. So that was a lot of fun. And it's cool. It's a cool concept to think that it's my voice, right? And I just think it's such a mistake for someone to write a book and then not make an audio book with their own voice. Because the whole point is to build the relationship with the listener or the reader. And what better way to build a relationship for them than for them to hear your voice? So that was fun. I did that in my guest bedroom, shut the door, kind of closed the blinds and had my nice mic and just it's, it's actually surprising how hard it is to actually do that. Talking, we do it all the time, but actually recording it and speaking in a very deliberate way, it's it's tough and you get tired. I had to go and lay down and stuff. It's it's, it's a fun, fun project. So it's draining. I mean, you're locked in the entire time. You're reading, you're making sure your voice is coming in well uh, or coming in you know, crisp. And the tonality is awesome. Uh, there's probably no white noise. I mean, I'm sure you have a sound engineer or audio mixer uh, helping with that, of course. But it, it's really not an easy process. And I even think on my end, after monitoring or you know doing an hour and a half here, 
I get a little bit winded as well as time goes. So, but reading is a, is obviously another function to you. I know you can probably read kind of similar to how I can speak. I, I can go a lot longer talking probably than you can go talking. And likewise, you can read along longer than my brain will have the capacity to do. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the funny thing is, is when you're talking off script, just the way we're talking right now, you're easy, you're flowing, you make less mistakes. But then as soon as there's a script or you're reading line by line from the book, you start tripping over your words and it gets a lot harder. And also it's harder to be as emotive, right? You're just reading and you have to remind yourself, well, someone's actually listening to this. You don't want to put them to sleep. And so you need to have a little bit of expression. I don't know how successful I was with that. We're good. You were really good. Yeah. As a I cannot you, listen to my own audiobook. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, you sounded very crisp. So I guess back to the question before, because we went on a tangent. What what has been your biggest takeaway from you know being an author? What what what, what yeah, I guess to start with, with the the most valuable thing that you got out of the process. The most valuable thing is definitely is definitely the network and the credibility that you get right? We, we talk about books being an oversized business card. It's a very great way to break the ice, establish credibility. You know, what better way to bump into somebody at a conference or something and just hand them a book, right? So we do a lot of book giveaways and stuff like that when we're on the road. And I think that's super powerful. And even if someone never reads it, but they just see that you took the time to write a book and maybe it helps that you have good reviews on Amazon and a lot of reviews and stuff like that, that does go a long way. Is there anything about the book you would do differently um, on, on the first one? And will there be a revision at some point, do you think, coming in the next couple of years now that your knowledge and, and the market's changed and there's different insights that you could probably put into the property with, or sorry, the book with more kind of live action and, and bullets? There's probably some things that I would change in the book as far as reserve amounts or different maybe ideas about bridge loans versus fixed rate versus floating rate you know maybe some some things like that maybe have slightly changed but i don't i don't know about necessarily going back and rewriting it completely i kind of i'm kind of lazy is what i am yeah yeah you're really lazy as a 26 year old running a um, you know, soon to be hopefully a $450 million real estate portfolio in the world, one world trade center, uh, with a beautiful watch collection. You're, you're a bum, uh, without a doubt. Uh, any other thoughts on the book? Uh, what do you think the most important takeaway for a reader or listener for that specific book is? For what the would definitive, you walk away with? For the definitive guide to underwriting multifamily acquisitions, it, it's, it's a really good book for people to read, whether they want to be an active sponsor like ourselves or a passive investor. I think it's great for passive investors to read the book as well, just to understand what's going on behind the hood a bit or under the hood, I should say. So for people who think that underwriting is very complicated, it is, but for them to think that it's inaccessible or that they shouldn't even bother looking at the numbers because it's so complicated, I disagree. I think take a look at the book and skim through it for an hour and get a much better understanding of the numbers. So that way you're well equipped to to speak to them or evaluate them more intelligently. You know, and I can actually attest to that and give you a testimony because at first when I saw, you know, these comprehensive, comprehensive spreadsheets, I was like, oh my gosh, this is uh, beyond my pay grade. And I'll know there's no way a guy like me would but be, be able, uh, will be ever, we will will be ever able to learn something like this. But as time progresses, you just take little chunks and you kind of, you know, go through it and you realize that it's not scary. And there's a beautiful thing called Google where you can type it in or chat GBT that will give you a great answer to help you uh, put things together uh, mentally to really be able to comprehend and dissect the uh, information associated in spreadsheets like that and just underwriting in general. Yeah, absolutely. Good stuff. Any final takeaway on this note before we get to your sickness? No, I think that's it. I mean, people can check out the books, both of them uh, on our website, lscre.com. And you know, we have some other tons of other YouTube videos on our YouTube channel that do some underwriting walkthroughs and talk about the book topics. Cool. All right. Now on the personal side of the note, as I said, and you know, maybe we'll start a GoFundMe for Rob to help with his sickness and his addiction. Maybe we'll send him to rehab, maybe send him some flowers to the office 
Uh, he really needs it. Maybe a bottle of whiskey or something. I don't know. But why don't you hold up your left wrist? And maybe do you want to take it off and show? I don't know if you've taken it off, if you showered in it, if, you, if you're allergic to taking it off due, due to the fact that it's your new baby and you can't let it out of your sight. But what did you just acquire? And please do not share any uh, details. And secondly, I am slightly offended as I learned of this today um, that my, my dear friend bought a new piece. So if you want to look closely for the, the audience uh, who's listening, this is a Pate Philippe calendar watch with a rubber strap with something that's incredibly rare, which is a Tiffany and Co stamp on it, which basically makes the watch intrinsically how much more valuable would you say? And how much more rare? Why don't you get into the whole inter workings of this, how you came up upon it? Maybe shout out your uncle, who is your new uh, dealer. Uh, don't spare a detail. Drug, drug dealer, you might say. Right, right, right. Exactly. For you, that's your, your drug because you don't drink alcohol. You don't do drugs. You're, you know, very much so, uh, you know, I'm not going to say square by any means because you're not that at all, but, you know, you live a very uh, tamed life. You're very disciplined. You don't, you know, you don't drink, you don't do any drugs, but I guess your drug of choice is uh, the watches. So dive into it, please. Yeah, no, I thank you for giving me this opportunity. Uh, you got a couple things right, a couple things wrong. So this is not a rubber strap. This is a, a leather, leather strap on a deployment clasp, as you can see here, deployment buckle, I should say. And this is a Patek Philippe 5940J, which is a perpetual calendar. And a perpetual calendar is a watch that keeps time for ever. It's so smart. It knows when it's a leap year. So when it's February 28 and then goes to March 1, this watch knows, right? So it keeps track of the leap year and leap years come every four years. So you have one, two, three, four. If you're not mistaken. Well, according to my watch, it's actually not a leap year. Next year is the leap year. That, that's what I meant. Sorry, 2024 is a leap year. That's oh, exactly yeah. right. That's exactly right. So a perpetual calendar also tells you the month. It tells you the day of the week and it tells you the day. So here we have Wednesday, September. It's the third year in the leap year schedule. And it's also the sixth day of the month. And then also for fun, we also have a moon phase. So the moon phase shows you the moon phase. <laughs> so basically right now, as you That's can see, so as you can see, kind of, we got some stars in the sky and we've got a beautiful crescent moon there or something. I don't know. It's not a full moon, right? It looks like we're a few days at least away from a full moon. And then that's yellow gold, not rose gold, correct? Yeah. Unfortunately, you know, I'm a rose gold guy, but unfortunately th this watch was, this example is in yellow. Uh, but I had to, of course, acquire this piece because of the rarity of it with the Tiffany stamp here. So the Tiffany stamp means that this watch was actually sold at a Tiffany and co boutique and Patek Philippe has a long 172 year relationship with, uh, Tiffany. And so they do sell a few limited pieces through their Tiffany boutiques. And then that's how you get the, the Tiffany stamp or the double signed watch, which makes the watch 50 to hundred times rare, which usually results in, a 1.5 to 3x increase in the value of the watch because of its rarity. And so I I think this is a fantastic piece. I think it's beautiful and it's it's a bit underrated, I think. I think a lot, a lot of people overlook it in the Patek Philippe catalog. And I think especially with the Tiffany & Co. stamp, I think this will be a very, very valuable watch they'll appreciate in time. So how does this fit now in your current inventory? Can you maybe go through? Because this is you've got the you got a a steel, you've got a, a rubber strap, and then you have the leather strap. Is are you now that you are likely going to sell your platinum Daytona? Does that leave you with just three pieces at the moment? And then also the reverso. Perfect. Okay, yeah, gotcha. so you can't forget the reverso. Reverso is a, a very beautiful, understated watch. I got a, I've got a vintage one. I found it. I was in Paris couple years ago and i found it in germany yeah, yeah. i was in paris i saw it online in germany i was on the phone with them and i said you know what rather than shipping this to back to new york why don't i just fly to germany can i pick it up flew to germany went straight from the airport straight to the jeweler picked it up and had a fun little day trip in munich so but anyway i think uh just generally speaking i mean everyone has their different tastes and watches and whatnot but i think we talk about watches a lot and i think the perfect collection if there ever was one would be 
a leather strap dress watch, right? This is, you can wear it with, with, with a suit, of course, and, and look very elegant and people aren't, you know, old money's not going to scoff at you. This is a very old money approved piece, which you got to have. And then you also need your sporty, solid steel or gold piece, you know, whatever it is, something, something sporty, that's like a solid bracelet. And then you need your, I don't say you need, but a rubber strap, right? A rubber strap piece is just so sporty, so cool, like a Rolex Yacht Master or an Aquanaut. Uh, that's just so cool. So the, yeah, rubber is is beautiful. I think the dream for, in my opinion, uh, and I'll start, you know, hopefully accumulating soon is, you know, some sort of a steel piece, as you mentioned, um, a gold piece, like a, a gold day date, a presidential day date. I think it's just gorgeous. You know, you can get the anniversary if you want the rose look, but even a white face or a black face or the green face looks beautiful. I'm not really the biggest fan of the champagne dial, uh, but a gold piece, a steel piece, a rubber piece and a leather piece, exactly to your point is like the dream for, you know, at that point you're really sorted out. You have a piece for every single occasion. You know, the steel piece could be, you know, a, a Submariner. Uh, it could be a Daytona. It could be a GMT, something uh, of that nature. Uh, if you're really, really cool, you could have the Nautilus, obviously, but there's now we're talking about a different, different league. We're talking about, you know, high end high school football to, uh, and that's all due respect to the piece I mentioned before to, you know, the Patriots. So obviously a very large step up there uh, with that, without a doubt, but you know, those are kind of the ideal four four pieces. Uh, knowing what you know right now and with your inventory, I believe though this is not your favorite piece. Your your favorite piece is the the the, the joint you wore on your wrist previously and have been wearing probably until the last week, which would be the Nautilus that you had. And so that's still the ringleader, the steel, the steel individual, or so the steel piece with the sleek profile. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think we we debuted that on the show a little bit uh, a couple episodes ago. I think. So yeah, that, that remains just a magnificent piece. Very, very special, rare in its own right. Not quite as rare as this, but, but rare in its own right. And, uh, what did, I, what else did I want to say? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'd be curious to know if people think that uh, watch talk is interesting or if we're too off topic, obviously this is very off topic, but, uh, do they think we're, we're nuts? What do they think? Yeah. Well, everyone has a lot of opinions, uh, you know, opinions are like, you know what, everyone's got one. Uh, so we'll be curious to know in the comments, uh, which people tend to uh, leave their opinions, uh, if it's a topic of uh, interest or a topic of shut the hell up, you brat. So be very curious to know uh, the thought on it. But one way or another, I guess we'll be polarized because if everyone likes you, nobody loves you. So uh, with that said, any other things that you're thinking of uh, or any watches that you're thinking about acquiring in the meantime, or are you going to stand pat for maybe two months before you uh, accrue anything or uh, accumulate anything else, I should say? So one thing I find really interesting is it's hard to really know what you think until you experience a watch. And so you might look at a watch online and say, I love this piece. I really want this piece. And then you, you're so sure of it and then you get it and then you wear it. And then there are things that you never quite realized about it. And those things, uh, you know, you bother you or they turn out, it ter- doesn't turn out to be exactly what you want. And so I think that's the interesting evolution of collecting and enjoying watches is your tastes do change. And then also your understanding of things change, right? You might want something that has a more complex style and then maybe you want something simpler or maybe you want you know, like a bigger watch and then maybe a smaller watch and, all those different things, which makes it such an interesting uh, journey uh, for 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 collecting and everything. So I think that's something that I'm learning a lot, and that's why we're kind of bringing up this recurring theme of how I'm now allergic to Rolex. Rewind a, a year ago, I was nothing but Rolex and just was was having all these Rolex dreams. And you're the happiest guy in the ever wearing your platinum Daytona, which literally is collecting cobwebs and dust seemingly. So. Exactly. So it's amazing how things change and how your how your preferences change and tastes change. So I think that's why it's really valuable, whether it's watches or anything else, to talk to people who are experts and get feedback from people uh, because, you know, you might get a crazy idea to buy XYZ watch and then it turns out to be the wrong move. So you need to have people in your corner that you trust to help you make the right decisions. Absolutely. Well, any other personal thoughts about what you're thinking of doing next in life? Uh, where you're going to be next, any any details you'd like to go over before we conclude the show? So next week, we'll be recording in uh, 
San Antonio or Houston, one of the two. And I think San Antonio. So and that actually have Brad as a celeb guest. That's correct. That was my thought. So Brad and I, who's our director of acquisitions, he is we're, we're him and I are going down to Texas next week. So we'll be together. We'll be in the car all the time. We probably won't record in the car, but we will definitely find time to record with you and and have that episode highlight him. Absolutely. And that'll also be maybe a little bit more uh, this maybe chapter coming up in, in the show, a little more of the underwriting uh, details. And I think October may be a little bit more of a month of interviews, as will be with many of our friends, including um, some legends in the mastermind space and also capital raising space. We're hoping to have Hunter Thompson, our friend, our colleague on, and then also our dear friend uh, and capital partner as well, Sam Silverman on the show, and perhaps a few more that we find of value. So maybe October will make it interview month and have you know a nice amount of different voices on the show, and then hopefully uh, perhaps uh, a closing. Uh, so, but don't want to get into that yet. Uh, but without further ado, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Thank you so much for giving your knowledge and insights and kind of breaking through as the author and architect of that book and then the architect of the spreadsheet that has uh, over 10,000 downloads. And obviously uh, as a author selling over 20,000 books gives you a little bit more credibility than the average person. So thank you so much for um, breaking down that knowledge and being patient uh, with me through my whole education process, but also to other people whom you have helped and impacted and got on the real estate career. There are so many people that reach out to us consistently who praise you and are very appreciative for the information out there. So from the whole community, we want to say thank you. Um, with that said, once more, if you found this episode interesting, if you found uh, the underwriting stuff compelling and you think someone uh, could find value of it, please, please, please send it to them. Like, subscribe, comment, whatever to the show. It does mean a lot. We're working on eventually getting some engagement going and actually doing an intro and really uh, improving just the whole production and quality of the show. That's something that's important to me. Uh, I go a little crazy if I don't see everything to be perfect. I have grand visions for where this is going to go, um, but it's one listener at a time, one show at a time. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, any comments, feedback, or criticism uh, that we can work on, we're always open to it. We do see it. And we do listen to it. So um, all the comments, I see them, or at least they get told to me. I don't really look through them, but Rob will go through it with me because I get a little sensitive, but it's okay. It makes me better. Uh, but once again, thank you so much. And if you're interested in kind of attending the event in October 17th to the 15th, please let me know reach out to me my email is craig at lsere.com that was a mouthful rob thank you so much for being on the show as always the founder and the principal rob beardsley and we will catch you next time thank you so much for listening to episode 12 peace